Excellent. Well, it's a real honor and privilege to come down here to talk to you this morning. I'm not sure how Archana found me, but she did um, somewhere on LinkedIn or something. And uh, it's really great. And, you know, I'm very honored to come and talk to you. Um, my subject, actually, before I say that, I should also thank those who introduced me to the yellow submarine uh, last night. Uh, I always believe when you come to university, you really, you really want to find out, or an institute, you really want to find out where people drink, <laughs> you know, because if you, if you see where they drink, then you know what they're like, <laughs> I, in my view. And I had a very pleasant evening there. Um, my subject today is uh, disruption in the airline business, uh, the lessons of history. Um, I actually did a history degree, uh, and, and people in the modern age, they say, how can you do this? You know, how can you read history and then become an airline executive? And in those days, you know, we didn't have business degrees. We didn't really have, there were MBAs, which was an American invention. Um, and, you know, but in the UK, you couldn't study business. You had to study a liberal arts degree or a very scientific degree, engineering or, or chemistry or whatever. And really, you know, rather like um, being employed in the Indian civil service, I guess, people came around and, and employed you, you know, for your brains, not for your um, kind of experience or your, or your, your particular uh, skills. Um, and that's the way I've always recruited myself. So if anyone wants to join Indigo, what I'm looking for is, you know, really bright people and people with the right attitude. Because actually, attitude is everything in business. Anyway, on the subject of airlines, um, it's a crazy world. Uh, airlines have always been a very difficult business to make money in, and you can see that in India today. Uh, it continues al along the same theme. Um, but what I'm going to touch on is, is really to give you a picture of you know, the airline business and where it's been and where it's come from, and the disruptions along the way. And then I'm going to try and paint a small picture of what the next disruption might be, which is ha hard to do. Um, and I'm probably going to be wrong, but at least it will hopefully get you thinking. Um, there's a few cliches I use, uh, and um, I think one of my favorite ones is, he who forgets the lessons of history is bound to repeat them. Um, and that certainly applies in, in, in the airline game. When you look back, you know, we've had major technological advances at various times. In the 1950s went from flying propeller aircraft to jets. Um, and then in the 1960s, airlines were the first people into really large-scale online transaction processing, OLTP, um, when we used to talk about computer systems, IBM 3060s and all sorts of machines I've forgotten the name of. Um, and we used to you know, talk about millions of instructions per second and the sort of basic IT, which everyone today takes for granted. And you know, it's all in the cloud and never ever thinks about it. Uh, but in those days, it was a very critical part of changing the industry. And those who didn't keep up fell away. Those airlines didn't have the scale to compete and to buy all this technology. A lot of them fell away. But then in the 1970s, there was a, another disruption came along, which was deregulation. Initially started in the US, but as I'll describe, it moved on, on to Europe in, in due course. But the other big disruption um, was the introduction of the new aircraft type, the 747. And when you look back at the history of the 20th century, you know, probably the introduction of the 747 is one of those big moments in time um, in terms of engineering and technological innovation. And I remember talking to a guy who was a very good friend of mine who was a bit older than me. And he said, you know, I was, he, he was an airport manager. And he was in Bangkok in 1971 when British Airways first flew the 747. And he said, you know, Willie, I was on the ramp in Bangkok. I'd done the courses. You know, I'd, I'd uh, read the manuals. I'd trained for the introduction of this airplane. And he said, then it arrived. He said, I'd never seen it before. And it came in to land, having flown from London. And he said, I was just shaking with you know, anticipation and 
thinking, how the hell are we going to handle this? Because it was double the size. You know, the aircraft at that time had 150 seats, 160 seats. 747, you could put 400 on. And it completely changed travel um, over the, the, the succeeding years as, as more and more were introduced. And eventually, you know, they built, I don't know, a couple of thousand. And, you know, now we've gone away from the 747 into more twin engines and so on. But that was another big disruptor. Again, a lot of airlines who couldn't compete, couldn't step up to it, um, but just fell, fell by the wayside. And then uh, in the 1990s, uh, big disruption in Europe, where the Europeans uh, woke up, saw what had happened in the US in 1978 with deregulation. The Europeans realized that they had uh, you know, a bunch of countries which now, you know, European common market, European Union, and they said, okay, we'll take away all regulation in Europe. We'll have a common aviation area, area in Europe. You can fly anywhere you like. Basically, if you're an airline company, you can, you can start services wherever you like across Europe, across that set of nations. And what happened there? Well, that drove the uh, origin, the genesis of EasyJet and Ryanair uh, and Wizz, who are the surviving low-cost carriers in Europe. And what's happened in Europe is, is fascinating. Um, and, you know, people don't believe me when I say this, but I say, look, what is happening is you've got the three big kind of ex-national airline groups. So you've got IAG, which is British Airways, Iberia, Verling, and a couple of other airlines. And you've got the IAG group. You've got the Lufthansa group, which is Lufthansa, you know, but it also is Austrian, Swiss, now Brussels Airlines, you know, the Germans are doing what they're best at, you know. <laughs> um, so you've got the, the German group, the Lufthansa group, and then you've got Air France KLM, which is a slightly strange combination of, uh, you know, French, Latin sort of French and very sort of dry Dutch, you know, logic uh, put together. Uh, it's survived now about 15 years, so probably it will survive forever. So you've got those three big groups. And then you've got Ryanair, you know, you've got EasyJet, and Wiz. And I always say, not too openly, but to some of my airline colleagues in Europe, I say, look, if you're not working for one of those six groups, you're, you've got a short life. Because if you're with TAP Air Portugal, or you're with Finnair, or you're with Alitalia, um, you know, life is going to be constrained. Because basically scale, scale is everything nowadays. In a deregulated world, you want to add scale. You want to add frequency. People want to travel when they want to travel. And to do that, you've got to be operating six times a day, eight times a day, whatever it is. And you'll only deliver that if you're part of a big, well-funded, well-capitalized group. And so, as I say, I think in Europe, you're going to see um, quite a bit of change over, the, over the time. This has all happened. You know, we go through these disruptive sort of events. Um, when the business itself, the underlying demand for aviation is very healthy. You know, world aviation grows at between 4 and 5% a year. Uh, and it's consistent over the last 40 years. Uh, and, you know, it's great to be working in a growing business. But as I said, you've got to choose which part of it you're in. And the other trend which never stops is there's a 2% reduction in real prices charged to the customer, real pricing every year, year by year by year. You can trace it over the last 40 years. Airline travel gets cheaper, okay, for the customer. And in India, what we've seen in the last 10 years is that the real cost of air travel, and you guys are all smart, you can discount inflation out of it, etc. The real cost of air travel has halved. Okay, you are paying basically fares today, which are exactly 50% of what they were 10 years ago. And if you don't believe me, just go back and look at all the Indigo annual reports and then the published data, and you can see ours is exactly that. 50, we're, we're, we're collecting now half what we used to collect uh, per passenger. And, you know, that obviously is a result of better technology, um, scale, um, you know, just general market pressure. 
and the amount of capacity coming into the market, not just ours, but also other airlines. So the customers are getting, you know, a hell of a deal, is what I'm saying. So fly, 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 okay? <laughs> it's, it's probably never going to be as relatively cheap to fly as it is now, because you can see in India, the airlines are coming a lot of pressure because fuel prices uh, were paying, I think, 65% more today than we were a year ago today for fuel. And fuel is 40, 45% of our cost. So, you know, it's quite a, it's a difficult game at the moment. Um, but do take the advantage or take advantage of it and fly. Um, the other thing to say, uh, you know, if, you, if one's trying to look at disruption in the airline business, is you have to, you have to remember that what I call the dark hand of government, okay? <laughs> government, please don't quote me. Um, <laughs> you know, in the US and in Europe, um, government has kind of left airlines to themselves uh, through the process of deregulation. What it is critically important for governments to do is to regulate safety and operations and make sure that, you know, the traveling public is protected, obviously. And it's, it's, uh, it's an absolutely critical role. And um, agencies like the Federal Av Aviation Authority, um, the European Air, and, um, Air Safety uh, Agency, you know, they are absolutely critical in, in protecting uh, the public. And it's, you know, uh, it's a very serious point. And by the way, uh, you have to fly now. If you fly on IATA-type airlines, um, we're not an IATA member, but we go through the IATA operational safety audit. If you fly on airlines which have that IOSA, you have to fly four million times, four million flights, before the chances are you'll be involved in a catastrophic accident. You know, flying is a very, very safe uh, form of travel now. You know, it's not four million, it, you have to fly one in four million flights so multiply that by the number of people on each flight. And you see the chances of being involved in an accident are very, very minimal. And that's thanks to all this regulation and the fact that the, the uh, airline business has been uh, properly regulated. The problem comes when governments want to do more. And, uh, you know, this has been uh, historically there, you know, over the last 30, 40 years. The, the national carrier, unfortunately, is still... Um, a feature of many uh, countries uh, and areas of the world. And, of course, in India, you have, have Air India. What that does is it distorts the market because you have an airline which traditionally is state-supported and, you know, inevitably practices creep into it which are not necessarily economically sensible. And it's hard for the competitors to compete with somebody who has, has state support. So for a really, really um, vibrant aviation economy, I think you know, one has to accept that, that uh, you know, government shouldn't be involved. Having said all, all of that, of course, you've seen new airlines like um, Etihad and Qatar and, of course, Emirates, who have been started with, with state support. Um, now, Emirates is, is not uh, supported anymore and is, is a freestanding, profit-making entity by itself. But the others are still very much state-supported. Because some governments, particularly in the developing cycle, you know, realize that aviation is a hugely important part of their economy and can help drive uh, a country's economy. Years ago, 20, 30 years ago, if you went to Singapore, and uh, you're using the currency there. I think it was the $20 bill. There was a picture of a Singapore Airlines 747 on every $20 bill in Singapore. That was how seriously they took aviation. And they invested a lot of money. And many of you will have been through Changi Airport, probably the best airport in the world. Uh, many of you have traveled Singapore Airlines, one of the best airlines in the world. And you can see what it contributed to the growth of that economy. And GDP, you know, it's both, um, airlines are both an enabler of GDP and, of course, a beneficiary. And we have a rule of thumb. If GDP is growing at, uh, let's take India, 8%-ish, then our rule of thumb is that aviation demand will be double. 
Um, so we, we expect the market to grow at 16%. Actually, in India, it's growing at 20%, 20 plus. So um, yeah, it's remarkable. Uh, but normally, you know, GDP is, is both uh, helped along by airlines, but also obviously airlines are, are, are beneficiaries of that, of that growth. When I was growing up, um, Air India um, was, a, was obviously owned by J.R.D. Tata, and uh, I kid you not, Air India was, um, you know, had a fantastic image in, in the market. I, I clearly remember as a, a very young, you know, I was probably 12 or 13, but reading a um, Sunday Times, I was in England, the Sunday Times survey of airlines, and, it, and Air India was at the top. You know, they used to have a flight that went from, um, I think went Mumbai, Delhi, London, or Mumbai, London, it wouldn't, you know, it would have gone Mumbai, Rome, London, or something, then it went on to JFK. And that London, New York sector, everybody who was anyone in London flew on Air India because it was such a wonderful service. And, uh, you know, it was at the, at the top of the tree. And the Air India manager at that time, it's a true story, used to drive a Rolls Royce in London and live in a very ritzy apartment. Um, but that was sort of under private ownership. And then, you know, obviously it was nationalized and, and uh, you know, we know the history, history since. So I just think, you know, you've got to, you, to have a true aviation market, um, you, you, you have to have one which is not influenced by uh, government ownership. Um, so let me just uh, turn to the sort of what the next disruption is going to be. Um, you know, a lot of talk about uh, di the digital world. Um, it's helped us segment our customers better. Uh, we talked about personalization and so on. It's not that new, actually. You know, this, this stuff about you know, segmentation and personalization, you know, it's not that new. I'll tell you a story. In 1982, uh, I was at Cafe Pacific, and we managed to get one of these big IBM mainframes. We used to get it to, um, to kick out a, a piece of paper like this. And on the paper, um, what it had was a seating plan of the first class or the business class uh, um, cabin. And that piece of paper then went on a drinks tray, right? And each, it was rather like this piece of paper with squares. You know, each square was big enough to have a, a glass on it. And under the glass was written the name of the passenger sitting in that seat and what he usually drank. And so, you know, it was a perfect thing for the cabin crew to go around and say, good morning, Mr. Singh, you know, can I give you your large black label, right? And, uh, you know, the passengers loved it. They were called by name, which is absolutely critical in customer service. If you can call someone by name, you know, you're halfway there. Uh, and, you know, Mr. Singh got his usual black label. It just broke down a bit when we didn't train the crew enough. So at 7 in the morning, we were going to say, Mr. Singh, here's your double black, you know? <laughs> And with the best one in the world, not every Mr. Singh drinks double black at seven in the morning, you know. So, you know, it, it kind of went well. It, it, you know, training is, training is, is a lot of, uh, of the journey. Um, anyway, so we, we did a bit of that uh, way back then, um, per personalization and, and segmentation. And then that grew into frequent flyer programs. You know, some genius um, dreamt up in the, actually in the US and American Airlines, which was always at the forefront actually of aviation development, um, but dreamt up frequent flyer programs. So you fly 10 times, you get a free seat and so on. And now, you know, it was a huge cost to airlines initially, but now those FFPs have become very valuable assets because with all the partnership programs, uh, with all the people trying to get access to that data, banks prepared to pay for it, you know, huge sort of uh, machines that they've become. They're actually, for many airlines, they're the most you know, valuable part of their, uh, of their assets is their frequent flyer program. But other things have started, well, started to happen, um, which have changed the business, disrupted it. Package tours, you know, and, and this is a very live example. I was talking with one of our customers, one of the online travel agencies the other day, and I was talking about, asking about package tours. And he was saying, well, a few years ago, we used to sell 35,000 a year to Thailand from India, um, package tours. Now we sell 3,500. You know, what has happened 
is that the same people who five years ago were buying package stores, now the whole thing has changed. You know, we've got into this dynamic packaging, it's called, which is basically that smart people just go on and they buy, you know, every part of it um, in series. They don't buy it as a block. Uh, and this has changed not just his business quite a lot, but it's changed European business a lot, where there used to be a lot of these charter carriers, and they used to basically fly from the north to the south to the sun every, every summer, um, you know, and the same thing to an extent in North America happened. But all those, they, a lot of them have gone out of business, or they've converted into seat only. They, they sell seat only packages, which is not really a package, <laughs> it's just a seat. Um, and so that's, that, that again, and, it, and that's helped along by the whole, obviously, you know, the whole internet age. Um, again, a big, big disruption to, to the aviation business. The other thing I'd say is that the holiday business, you know, has changed in my lifetime. When I was uh, quite young, uh, I took a trip, I took a package tour, actually. I went to Hong Kong, Bali, which was then very different, um, you know, Bali, and then uh, to Singapore, uh, and I took the train up to KL. And doing that, I just booked the package tour. Uh, I went with a girlfriend, and we just did it. We didn't think about, you know, being able to book anything within those destinations, you know, from England. You know, we just sort of bought the tour. We got the program, you know, day one, day two, day three. We went, and the experience was just being in this place and being in a foreign, you know, uh, country, obviously Hong Kong and then Bali. And, and then when we were there, we sort of shuffled around, went to the beach, whatever, you know, um, and somebody tried to sell a you know, tour up to the hills or something. Um, and when we were in Singapore, we thought, oh, you know, Singapore was a bit boring after two or three days. Let's go to KL, just jump on the train, go to KL. Well, that's all changed because my, one of my daughters, who's 20, 22, came out to India uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and it was actually, well, a few months ago now. I, it was, I'd just arrived, so I couldn't really help her. So she basically fixed everything sort of on the internet. And so she, she shows up in, in, uh, in Udaipur and uh, has a sitar lesson, you know. And then she goes down to Jaipur and she's booked a cookery class. Um, and of course, you know, she's got the regular Taj tour, but she's doing all these, you know, very micro sort of things. The cookery class had four people in it, you know, and some lady who's pushing a business, you know, um, doing brilliantly. And the, the sitar class had her and she uh, and her boyfriend. Um, and they were the two, you know, and the sitar teacher. And, you know, just incredible sort of micro um, tourism, as it were. Um, I should say, though, that, and the cricketers among you will appreciate this, her boyfriend is a spitting image of Alistair Cook, who's, you know, who's just retired, ex-England captain. He looks just like Alistair Cook. So they were a bit surprised. They were in the back streets of Udaipur somewhere. And uh, you know, there's a little party, there's a family, Indian family, who didn't speak any English, but they said, oh, you know. So they, they asked, uh, uh, Ollie is his name, Ollie, oh, come over here, you know, he wanted to take a picture of Ollie, the boyfriend. And of course, my daughter was completely out of it. You know, they thought, they, th they thought this guy was really Alistair Cook. But of course, Alistair Cook was plotting the downfall of the Indian team in England this year. <laughs> he was really in, in, in uh, England. Anyway, I had to get that in just for, because you know, I, I know that when we come, when the English team comes over here next time, we will get whipped. <laughs> it always happens. Um, anyway, so th this experiential thing uh, has, I think, become important and uh, maybe not a full-time full sort of disruptor, but it has changed, changed our business. Um, sorry, I'm conscious of time. If I drag on our China, you have to... Uh, sorry? You'll let me know. Good. Um, because the, the other thing that's changed, and, and this is perhaps uh, slightly... Unusually, you would have heard of it, but Japan used to be a big provider of outbound travel. You know, obviously it went through the Japanese economic miracle. You know, outbound travel grew very much. When I first, I worked there in 1981, it was like four million a year. By the mid 90s, it, it was 16 million a year. Well, today, it's still 
about 16, it, it varies between sort of 16 and 18 million a year. It hasn't grown in the last 20 years. And why is that? Well, it's because the Japanese, you know, the, the value they place on life is very, very, very high, probably the highest in the world. They get very spooked by terrorism incidents um, or anything else, you know, can go wrong. Uh, and they, they are very nervous travelers. But with technology, what they've discovered, the whole generation of younger people sort of say, well, I don't need to go to Bali because, you know, I've got it on YouTube. You know, anytime I want to sort of have a look at Bali, I can look at it. And it's a very curious uh, kind of movement, which has, has really limited uh, the growth of outbound travel. I mean, the Japanese airlines are fine because they are dealing with the huge growth of Chinese outbound travel into Japan. And Japan as a tourism um, destination has grown exponentially. But, you know, it's, it's, it's an unusual effect, if you like, of technology that actually dissuades people from traveling, a certain type of person, you know, somebody who's very introvert, very nervous of going overseas, you know, doesn't want to deal with the, the outside world too much, can actually sit in their bedroom and experience so much of it through, through technology. And I see that as a bit of a threat to our, to our business in the, in, in the longer term, um, together with, you know, the usual threats of, of disruption and so on. So what is the next sort of um, disruptor uh, let me go away from the airline business for a little bit, talking about this segmentation and personalization. And again, I like to illustrate things with a personal touch because people remember that. My wife is Japanese, okay? She's very low maintenance. You know, she, you know, I have a wonderful wife. She's very low maintenance with one exception, that like a lot of Japanese women of her generation, she is in love with Louis Vuitton, okay? <laughs> Um, so every year, you know, birthday, um, wedding anniversary, Valentine's Day, Christmas is a kind of Louis Vuitton moment, <laughs> possible <laughs> moment, right? Now, so I've lived a you know, fairly international life and I've bought Louis Vuitton products in 10 places, okay? In London, San Francisco, Singapore, Bangkok, KL, Hong Kong. Uh, Joe Berg, uh, you know, the list goes on. You know, over the last five, six years, you would have thought, sorry, not five, six years, over the last 20 years, um, you would have thought that somebody in Louis Vuitton, and, and for most of the last five or six years, I've used the same credit card, you would have thought somebody would have figured this out, you know, because every time they ask for your name, you know, and you're, you know, what you're doing and so on, there was no link between these 10 different places. And they are in a very high value, you know, high cost of purchase business. You know, where every, you know, the, the cheapest thing you can buy there is $200. You know, you're, you're straight away, you're, you're spending hundreds of dollars each time. And yet, they haven't bothered to, to build, you know, a, a proper customer relationship management system. And to me, that's a, it's a very curious example of where, uh, it's a failure, uh, to my mind. Um, you know, of, of what is possible these days. Now, with airlines, you're dealing with a whole different scale. You know, we have, we carry about 60 million people a year as Indigo. Of course, some of those are the same person traveling, you know, eight, nine times. So let's say we carry, I don't know, I haven't really looked at it, but maybe it's 40 million individual people. Do we really want to know about those 40 million, you know, People come to me and say, oh, we can do all this now, digitization, you know. We can tell you about all your customers. Well, you can't really. You can, you can give me a record of all the customers, but that, you know, having a record of the customer doesn't help me. I want to, you know, do something intelligent um, with, that, with that record and with that customer. And that's where I, I wonder, you know, are robotics, you know, going to help in that? Possibly. You know, now we are... Um, uh, and it's not an indigo thing, but airlines generally, you know, we're using robots for uh, disruption management. So when your flight is delayed, uh, we're using sort of automated robotic system to go through passenger manifest and to decide, you know, how to deal with those passengers, which flights they have to be transferred onto, you know, what other opportunities available, etc. So in, in that kind of transaction, 
we can see that this brave new world is, is having a, a, a beneficial effect. But, you know, it may be on that side, but on the marketing side, it's really having no effect. I'll give you other examples from other, other environments where somehow, you know, we haven't got a grip of this stuff yet. Many of you probably use um, Booking.com, yeah? Well, you know, I use Booking.com. Uh, for one reason or another, I used it from two different, you know, once for my email uh, at work, once from my personal email, you know, so uh, sometimes I'm called William Bolter, sometimes I'm called Bolter William, you know, so dear Bolter, you know, upsets me a bit, but anyway, um, so, you, you know, you sort of use this, but then I, I was in Africa until, you know, six months ago, and I used to go down to Cape Town for a bit of an R&R &R from time to time. I was in Angola, which is a difficult country. I go down to Cape Town. Now, six months later, you know, I've left Cape Town. I'm not going back to Cape Town probably, you know, the next 10 years, but I'm still getting, you know, offers in Cape Town. You know, Booking.com keeps me informed about the hotel rates in Cape Town, so big deals in Cape Town. And I just think, you know, what is, that's a failure. You know, you should have noticed over the last three months, I haven't been to Cape Town once. So please stop, you know, pushing these offers. And then, you know, it's the other, other sites, uh, I don't think it's Booking.com, but <laughs> something that always amuses me is when the other sites send you a, a note, uh, you know, you've all booked up, and then they send you a note and say, you know, prices, Prices in Copenhagen, which you just booked, you know, 10 days ago, prices in Copenhagen have gone down by 10% for the dates you booked. And you think, do I really want to know that? You know, <laughs> you know, thanks very much. You're telling me I was an idiot. I should have waited. I should have waited 10 days, and then I would have got a better price, you know. Or I guess they're hoping, oh, you know, you'll cancel your reservation and you'll rebook in a, in a cheaper price. Who wants a hassle? You know, we've got busy lives. I can't be bothered to save, you know, $10 to rebook Copenhagen, you know. Um, so those are a couple of examples of, of the sort of failure of that, of that inter, you know, the, the technology works great, but the, the connection with the customer is, is still, still, you know, has some, some way to go. Um, and talking about frequent flyer programs, um, I must tell you the, the best story, I think, is... You know, there's a very big global airline. If I said their name, instant recognition, 100% recognition. Well, they got into frequent flyers, right? The frequent flyer program, they got a big program, millions of members, you know. Some really intelligent, bright spark said, this is what we should do. On the website, we asked the customers for their frequent flyer program number on the first screen. And if they give it, it means they're a member, we can charge them a higher price. Can you believe it? Mr. Bolter, you're a frequent flyer of Airline X. You know, you're clicking on the website. You know, you're obviously a frequent customer. Your stickiness is there. You're unlikely to leave us. So very subtly, when you get the price back, it'll be $40 more than if you'd just gone in as Mr. Bolter, non-frequent flyer. You know, you are a frequent flyer, your privilege is to pay more. You know, <laughs> what genius thought of that? You know, anyway, it lasted about three days because it didn't take long before, you know, people, you know, airline customers are quite smart. And it didn't take long and it was, it was kind of changed. But to me, that is the, you know, absolute example of, you know, frequent flyer programs gone mad, and technology, you know, not being applied in, in, in the right way. So, as I say, I think, you know, the next disruption will be something around um, this uh, uh, digitization, you know, big data, all this stuff, but getting it applied in the right way. And uh, I think we've got a long, you know, a long way to go, because... The airline game, you know, you're dealing with lots of people. You're dealing with huge numbers of customers, all have different reasons for traveling. It's really hard to, to get uh, proper attention uh, at the right place at the right time. And so I, I think it's going to take, take a little bit of time.